Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. I'm really excited today because it's beautiful and sunny and kind of still. We've had such windy days uh, for the last week or two weeks or a while. We're actually, right after we're done here, we're gonna go out and plant the first of many shrubs from the season. Like the first day that we are getting the auger out and putting some things in the ground, I am ready for it this year. I'm so excited. I was looking back at pictures of what we did last year Oh, the got amount, a lot done. yeah, I just like, I forget where we started last year. I mean, we still had our whole front yard last year mm -hmm. and it wasn't until like, I don't know, early summer was when we started ripping out the stuff up front to get trenching and all of that done. I don't know. I was I imagine here in a couple of years when the, the trees start oh, yeah. getting some size. Yes. And, and we'll start looking full, you know, yeah. And like we have some shade maybe yeah that'd be so nice but i feel like we came so far last year way further than i had thought we ever would and i really am looking forward to buttoning up more areas i mean getting the area around the hartley kind of like done a little bit more getting some flower beds developed so anyway yeah the idea the prospect of planting is just like oh i'm so excited also i wanted to show you this i brought this out again i've showed it to you before but i'm just so thrilled with the streptocarpus. I've never had one before and it brings me so much joy every time I walk in this room. This is one of the plants that came in one of our unboxings from Little Prince. Was that in like January, maybe? Yeah, was it right before Christmas? Or after? I don't uh, maybe it was before, I don't know, but it has been in bloom since it arrived. Like it shipped in bloom and then it's just performed beautifully. I haven't potted it yet, you can see that. This is the pot I think I'm gonna put it in, but I love this plant, so it's just gonna sit here <laughs> for, the for the duration of this video. So let's jump into the first video from last week, which was inspiring ponds and water features. It was a submission video where you guys sent in pictures and information about the ponds that you have either installed yourselves, which like it's way over my head, the idea of installing and getting it right. Like I feel like I would install it and we'd have all kinds of problems. <laughs> or ones that you've had professionally landscaped. Also, uh, the styles were so different. I feel like we had a good sampling of different things that you could do in your own yard. From like that built up one and like a raised bed in that smaller DC garden, all the way up to the larger like natural swimming ponds. I like the idea of mm -hmm. that a lot. But there was some really good, really good ones. Thank you guys. To all of you who send in pictures and information. First comment was from Greg Whitstock, the pond guy. It was an honor to work with you. And yes, we will get that front lake when you guys are ready. So the, the first three we opened with in that video uh, were pictures that Greg sent over, two of which were from Greg's garden. And then one was from his designer, Brian. And both of those guys, they came over two seasons ago and installed the most beautiful pondless waterfall. It was near our gazebo. It was before we decided to um, pull the trigger on putting in the greenhouse. So we're actually going to be taking that up and installing it in a different location this year. But it was just like, it just fit in that area so beautifully and I enjoyed it so much. And Benjamin did too, he liked mm -hmm. to climb around on the rocks and uh, it just, it was just gorgeous. Anyway, I'm excited to see it running again. Uh, but we got to see Greg's uh, huge pond that like went right up to his house. That was in his Chicago garden. And then he actually um, texted you mm -hmm. with the one I showed, the next one I said was in their Utah home. It was actually not. That was in an inter, like they were in between. That was still in Illinois, I believe. Yeah, they were in between that bigger home and then their new home in Utah. And mm -hmm. so they were staying in a place anyway, he installed that like in the interim, like he just yeah. has to be in, around water. And then he sent you pictures of his Utah pond, which was yeah. gorgeous. Maybe we can put those on the screen. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, anyway, yeah, we, when I initially drew out our front garden, I had penciled in like a huge- Kind of a lake. It was kind of a lake with like complete with bridge over it and everything. Anyway, that would take an engineer and I, things take a lot more than I, initially think they're going to. Kalani said, question for you, or question for this, do you have to have insurance for ponds with an actual pond, especially if they aren't fenced? Do you know, you know? It, it might just go onto your like home insurance policy. Like if you have a, a pond or a pool or something. Uh -huh. Is it I'm, in private residence? I know like if you have it in a public place, you probably. Well, and it might also depend on like if you're in the city limits or if you're in county, but I don't know. Basically, we question. don't know. Yeah. yeah, it's something to look into for sure. Jane said the ponds are gorgeous, but how do they control mosquitoes from breeding in them? Oh, I think the number one thing is uh, you want to have moving water because they can't, 
they breed in still water, mm -hmm. like in, in bird baths with still water that's kind of stagnant or in areas of ponds where the water's not moving very much. So if you've got good uh, water movement, I think that takes down the possibility like greatly. There's also some things that you can put in water and I'm, I'm not like huge up on my knowledge on that, but I know there's like mosquito bits and things yeah. like that that I've used for fungus gnats in here um, that are helpful. Those of you who have ponds probably could chime in in the comment section, I'm guessing, with much more knowledgeable <laughs> answers than I can give on that. Uh, Sabrina said, would you be able to swim in that water? Would you want, or would you want to? In that natural swimming pot, I mean, you want to make sure it's deep enough for mm -hmm. sure, especially if you're jumping into it. Uh, but I think you can swim in any of those if you yeah. want to. It just depends on size and how much area and what kind of plant material and or fish that you have in there. You don't want to scare the crap out of your fish if it's too small of a pond. Uh, Sue said, how about ideas to create a garden shed? I'm looking to replace my shed and would love to see how others have incorporated one into their gardens. I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can do that right about the time ours is buttoned up. And yeah. We can do a little tour of ours. Uh, Jeannie V said, Laura says, got, uh, got to figure out a spot. What about the area where you have the hydrangeas that get smaller as they get near the willow? Which is no longer there. The willow's not there anymore. We had that removed oh, in the back garden. This garden I thought... Are you sure that they're not in the referring bed, to the other? The the fire lights start up big oh, and get smaller right. and smaller because the willow was sucking up so it's much. It's not a bad idea though, honestly, in that spot. If you could put like a birch tree or you know something like that in the back or build it up and put the birch tree up high, uh -huh. you could do like a retaining wall. That's not a bad idea. No, it's not because you would, it wouldn't be a direct view from the Hartley, but mm -hmm. it would be a view from the Hartley. Yeah. Like it wouldn't be like straight with the door or anything, right. but that, we didn't, don't need that everywhere. <laughs> We don't need balance and symmetry everywhere. That would be really pretty. You have mentioned wanting it under the weeping willow near Hebe, which shares the same space as the Hartley. Yeah. I think that would be beautiful because, I mean, a, a weeping willow with a pond is so classic, but I also feel like putting two huge features, like the beautiful greenhouse and a beautiful pond so close together, I think if we could spread our features out a little bit, yeah. it might make more areas of the garden interesting. I wonder if you're not as much of a fan of that idea also because it, um, like ponds, I don't feel like are formal to you and you want more formality around the around greenhouse. Around the Hartley, yep, you are right, yeah, yep. Um, ponds are more natural, like you want or water features to be natural mm -hmm. and that doesn't fit with the whole like, I like to glass look, greenhouse I like vibe. them to look like they were built into the area that was there like that there wasn't a fake stack of rocks you know what i mean yeah like and i know a lot of especially ponds in the beginning look that way because the plants are small and eventually it'll look like once the plants grow up that it's just nestled in um the way that our pondless waterfall went in under those junipers and crab apple it just like I told Greg and Brian, that was one of my, my worries that it would look like it didn't belong naturally there. It so looked like it belonged there yeah. when they were done. I just had to trust I think you, them. Yeah, and when you just let professionals do what they do, Yeah. it ends up looking right in the yeah. end. Anyway, yeah, we've got lots of different conversations about where to put stuff, but that's a great idea. Next video was planting up the cold frames in front of the greenhouse. I was so excited for this project because it means something was happening with the Hartley. We have something growing in, essentially in the Hartley at yeah. this point, because they're connected. Uh, but we kind of went over different the different ways of filling up. They were deep, deep raised beds like that. Uh, and then I put in some daffodils and violas and some uh, spring vegetables. And in fact, I just posted a story because I was lifting yeah. the lid and it's just so beautiful in there. The daffodils are so full of color now and um, that was fun. Uh, Lala Palooza said, fun things ahead. Idea if this YouTube thing doesn't work out, a line of children's books titled Benjamin's Big Problem. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good idea. He, I was explaining, I was showing you guys the plants that we had picked out down at the garden center and he just like walks up and said, a, said I have a big problem. Yeah. We have a big problem. And it was something about the rocks being in the gravel, right. or I mean the rocks being in the dirt or the rocks were covered with the dirt and he couldn't dig them up because he had this tiny shovel. He had one of my, one of, hold on, there's one in here. I don't know where he found the little shovel because it's, I think he got it out of the greenhouse. Mm. I was using it in there, uh, but he had it out there digging around in the soil. I'm like, well, dude, you can use a bigger sho shovel if you want to. It's cute though in a little kid's mind what their problems are. Uh, HM said, where do you get all that Espoma soil? I live in Southeast Indiana and cannot find anyone who stocks it. Well, we do work with Espoma, um, but we also, my parents' garden center has it. Uh, and we went down and picked up 
some the next day because we used what we had on hand and we needed a, a few more bags for the blackberry bed, which I don't think you guys, maybe you'll see that video by the time this one goes out. Um, anyway, so for us, it's been a little bit easier to get a, um, mm -hmm. a hold of. We've been able to like with seed starting mix one time we did order it through True Value and had it shipped to True right. Value. Yeah. Um, so that was one way we were able to get the bigger bags because my parents at the time only had smaller bags and we're, they weren't able to get a hold of bigger bags. It's squirrely sometimes with the shipping and, and where you can get it and stuff. So anyway. That's how we go about it. Julie's Garden Time said, it's so fun watching the Hartley and the landscape around it start to come to life. Uh, did you need to plant with Biotone or are there enough nutrients in the raised garden mix? First year, I think we're good uh, in terms of nutrients in the mix. There's a lot of good stuff. I kind of read off the bag what's in there. Alfalfa meal, kelp meal, there's um, uh, mycotone. What else is there? Earthworm castings in there? Probably. I don't know. There's a whole bunch of good goodies in there. And you could add biotone. There's no uh, no harm, I guess, in, in doing that. Uh, but I feel like it's kind of unnecessary. I may come along. I don't even think I'm going to need to fertilize them this spring. They're such a short crop. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe once. Maybe I'll fertilize them once. But typically, I don't. I'll add it in the next time I plant because every time you put a new crop in there, uh, you most, most of the time I need to top up with a little bit of something and then I'll add some nutrients back in the soil. In raised bed situations, I feel like that's super important because each crop is taking stuff from that soil and so you need to replenish that. Eugene said, why not a layer of alfalfa or straw after wood to save on raised bed mix? Yeah, you could, alf alf you could alfalfa do that. <laughs> <laughs> you could absolutely do that. In fact, I went over some of the different things that you can fill the bottom with, just all organic compostable kind of stuff. Um, so like yard debris, you know, so long as it's not diseased or insect ridden, um, leaves, branches, wood, you know, what have you, whatever you have on hand. Um, somebody asked about a bale of straw, I think, which I think would be fine. I think with smaller materials that compost faster, you're gonna have a lot more sinkage than you do with things that are gonna take a lot longer to compost. And I think if you've got things composting fast, they're going to suck more nitrogen out of the soil as opposed to something that's breaking down a lot slower. I think it's gonna steal less. Sure. Again, I really don't know anything about that process, but that's what <laughs> I'm guessing in my brain. In my brain, that's what I think. Yeah. So. Sharon said, wondering about having the soil in direct contact with the brick work inside the cold frame. Will it damage it? I ask because we built our home out of bricks and there are so many things we have to do in order to prevent damage, like wheat poles and making sure that the limestone caps and all the grout is maintained so that the moisture will not go into the brick and pop off the brick face during the freeze-thaw cycle. Thoughts? <laughs> you know, I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah, it's probably not a good thing, I'm guessing. Thankfully, it's on the inside of the cold frames, not on the outside. You know, if we occasionally, like every few years, have to come in and have like the bottom layers that might show a little bit repaired. Uh, I, I, I really know. have no, I mean, well, stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. It looks really nice right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Margaret said, we all know it's a Hartley. Can you just say it's a greenhouse? After all, I think it's fairly obvious. You know, I tried that and I, people are like, call it a Hartley. Well, it's also not it obvious for us because we have two structures. We have it's a, true. We have a we greenhouse, have two greenhouses. Mm -hmm. which is plastic, you know, a hoop house. Yeah. Um, and then we have a greenhouse, a glass, a glass greenhouse. House. I suppose you could call it a glass greenhouse, but it is shorter to call it a Hartley than a yeah. glass greenhouse. That's three syllables. Hartley is two. Yeah. You just naturally call things less syllables. Well, and we've, we had this conversation before and yeah. a lot of you guys chimed in and they were like, just call it a Hartley. That's what it is. Like, be proud of it. And yeah. I am. I am so proud of that thing. And I'm just like still in awe that it's sitting there in our in our yard and that we're going to get to use it maybe a little bit more to its full potential this year. Um, anyway, I'm used to calling it the Hartley now. And I call this the greenhouse now. And this is the studio. South Garden is growing on me. I still call it the new property sometimes. It's hard to, I don't know, name things yeah. sometimes. Uh, Nancy said, just out of curiosity, did you compare the cost of soil to the cost of the cut wood to fill the cold frames? Did you save money? You know, I, I saw a few comments about that, like you're wasting perfectly, perfectly good firewood. What would happen with our firewood? When we had that one year with the tremendous amount of snow, it was like 52 inches, and uh, we kind of knee jerked after that winter and we bought a ton of firewood. It spans the entire back of our barn, like three, three rows deep mm -hmm. and like as tall as I am entire length of our barn. We have so much firewood. Well, we also stopped burning quite as much because we started having kids. Well, 
We bought it when we didn't have kids. We did, and we were heating our house primarily with the wood stove at the time. Yeah. And we had since had a new furnace put in and gas run to the house. We have the house zoned so that we can control things separately. It's much more efficient. And with the kids, you're right, we started having kids, and then all of a sudden we're like, ooh, hot front of the fireplace. Yeah. It also um, like dries everything out so bad. It blows hot air out into the room. And um, I was so worried with our babies, like having it affect that, because we live our lives in the great room. We're in the great room all the time. And uh, like with Benjamin, he napped in the great room. And I was so worried about like all of his sinuses being all dried out <laughs> from the, the wood fireplace. I like wanted to make sure that everything was fine. Anyway, um, yeah, so we just stopped burning a lot of firewood. We use it like maybe three times this winter. It's more just for fun, you know? Yeah, it is. So it, it, to answer the question, we have an abundant, well, an overabundance of firewood yeah. sitting there. So for us, the value of it sitting there is kind of is dwindled over the years well, since we bought it. It was like five years ago or something too. Yeah. So like for us, the money spent on it, it's kind of like five years ago. And so yeah. it doesn't feel like, but I get it, you know, it's kind of like, ooh. Wood is pretty plentiful plentiful around here though. Like it's not, it is. It's not that hard we to get We used to go up to the hills wood. and you get a permit and then you cut a big dump truck load of wood. And we do that twice, usually for my parents' house every year. Super fun. I loved wood cutting days. Yeah because you'd have your picnic lunch and you'd all be up there as a family up in the you woods. Know, I probably have some video of us uh, in the past doing it. Yeah. Oh, that'd be it's interesting. Been, it's been a few years since we've done it. Yeah. Uh, there. Your way. Next video was how to prune raspberries. So mine just needed some attention and I went through the different types of raspberries, how raspberries grow, and then how to prune each type of raspberry. Um, I hope it was helpful to you guys. It's always a good brush up for me too, because like I, you know, my parents had raspberries growing up. I know how they treat them, but there's different ways of doing it too. Like they treat all of theirs, they're ever bearing, but they treat them as a one crop system. So they mow them all down in the spring. Um, so it's always a good thing to kind of refresh yourself with how you're to do it, you know, if you have the summer bearing type versus the ever bearing type, all of that. So Patty said, here I am hitting like before I even watch the video. Sure do love my morning fix of Laura and garden answer. I appreciate that so much. And I'm, I'm thankful for, you know, there's, I read on this video in particular, there was a lot of you who said, I don't even have raspberries. I'm not super interested in it, but I watched the video anyway and enjoyed it. And I appreciate that so much. Um, that means a lot to me. John said, loving your raspberry beds. Are they painted or stained black? They are stained black. Oh, I will try to locate the name of what that stain is and let you guys know. Uh, Victoria said, how do you deal with raspberry new stems that form from rhizomes in areas of the garden you don't want them or how do you prevent them? You know, I just pull them um, and that's how we use, usually do it like out at my parents' house where we've had raspberries forever. This year, I'm actually gonna go dig some of theirs when they start popping up where they don't want them because I am having a heck of a time getting my hands on more fall gold raspberries. I special ordered them last year, didn't get them. Special ordered them this year and we got zeroed out again. Uh, but they have a patch out there and so when their rhizomes start popping, I'm gonna go dig some up. So I'll take you guys out there when we do that uh, because I really wanna get that bed filled in. But you can, I've heard of people sinking like that bamboo guard. I'm not sure if that's what it's called, but it's like a thick plastic barrier that goes down yay deep. And you can dig that down um, so that when they start to grow out, they hit that plastic and they're not gonna grow down like a certain amount of inches and back out. Um, so I've heard of people doing that. I've heard of people all well, spraying them, um, pulling them, that sort of thing. So. I would just pull them. That's my method of choice. The Hoover tribe said, can you propagate the canes that you cut off and start a new plant? No, because all the canes that I cut off primarily are, I mean, raspberries are biennial, so their canes only last two years, and typically what you're cutting out are the dead canes for the most part. Also, can you leave the leaves and just put compost over instead of raking them up, or does that have an important benefit? You know, I feel like in some cases, especially maybe where you deal with insect or disease, it's a good idea to clean up leaves and debris because that's where the insects harbor over eggs. Um, so in our case, we deal with spider mites, we deal with aphids quite a bit. Um, so it's a good idea in most cases to pick up the leaves. Some areas of our garden, I don't worry about it as much, like under our honey locust trees, those leaves are so tiny. It's hard to get them all one, uh, but they lay flat, which is another thing. We mulch over most areas in our garden. So they lay nice and flat, even layer. So we don't have to like, when there's bulkier leaf leaves, uh, it's hard to mulch over them. You have to use a lot of mulch to cover up all those leaves. Otherwise they're popping through and it looks really messy. 
Cynthia said, do you need to spray them like you do with your fruit trees? Ah, uh, not that I'm aware of. I've never sprayed raspberry plants. They're pretty tough. Um, they're not really affected by much in our area, at least. I don't know. Did you see any common, like, no. any issues that no. people have dealt with? Which is nice. It's nice to have a fruit crop that you don't have to mess with in terms of spraying. Katrina said, do you have a video of building your berry trellis? We don't have a video of that because we didn't build them. We did kind of a tour when they were all done giving you all the specs. We had them built similarly, similarly, is that a word? Similarly. Yeah similarly to my parents' berry trellises because I like how theirs work. I like how they look. Uh, they're slightly different. We built ours a little higher and a little bit wider. I'm not sure like the wire cables are running at the exact same heights or anything, but it's a loose interpretation of my parents. Um, and then theirs, they left natural wood and ours are stained black. I like how substantial they look. I think that's the right word, substantial. Um, I couldn't think of a word earlier to describe those beds, but I like how they look out there and they're, they stand out. Uh, Dean said, how do you keep the birds from eating them? You can net them, I suppose. Usually, I don't see a lot of bird activity. I didn't see any, we only had a few berries last year, so we'll see what happens this year. Usually we don't have a huge problem with that. I have more of a problem with our blueberries. Mm -hmm. uh, the robins found our blueberries last year. Like one day I looked out there and there was a swarm of birds out there. I thought, what in the world? Sure enough, they had found all of our blueberries and they were bearing so heavily right then. So this next year, I'll probably be netting. Mm -hmm. those. It's nice that they're at a nice height to do that though. But there's not that many of them out there and so I can just drape some netting over very easily. It'll be, it'll be nice. Next video was three pruning chores. So hellebores, shrub roses, and paniculata or panicle hydrangeas. Three areas of my garden that were looking just so sad and brown. Everything is just looking brown. It's starting to look green. Uh, in fact, I told Erin, we were looking at the video. I had watched it just to make sure. I always watch videos one time before they go out. And I just told him like, is there anything we can do about the coloring? It just looks so like orange and brown. He was like, well, that's how it looks. It's true. That is how it looks. It's harder too when there's a bunch of leaves on the ground because it's hard to differentiate like between the plants you're looking at and a bunch of debris on the ground. Jennifer said, have you already create, you have already created so many videos with tasks that have to be done. Do you think it would be possible for you to create a monthly playlist, at least for spring and autumn? Then you could look up what and how to do everything in February or March. Thank you for your videos. I don't know anything about making a playlist. Would that, it's hard because they're all like sandwiched in vlogs and right. they're not like. What we've, what I've seen is that very few people click on playlists. Really? Like very few people. Our pl just our playlist maybe? Our playlist. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe other people have more success with it. So mm -hmm. that's kind of always been the thing is now we just do pretty much only playlists by season. Mm. So every year we has there's a new season and you know. Because that seems to be the, th the most common question is that people can't find older videos easily. Mm -hmm. So you can go back to whatever year you want. Oh, gotcha. Uh, Cynthia said, what was the rose fertilizer you used? That's a Spoma Rose Tone. I actually used it on all three of the things I was working on. I've been using Rose Tone on our hydrangeas for the, the past two years. They've done really well. They do well with Holly Tone or, or Rose Tone or Plant Tone really any any of those will work typically i use plant tone for hellebores but i knew i needed rose tone out for my hydrangeas and roses so i just used it on the hellebores and they'll do great with that as well rebecca said are hellebores poisonous i've read that that i've read that is it true i believe so i believe they are poisonous nobody messes with them though so that's not super worried about it old fashioned on purpose said if you cut a little taller every year on the hydrangeas will they eventually uh, be too tall can you cut them down shorter occasionally to keep them in check you can cut them down shorter, but you'll end up with a little bit more weak stems in the end. Uh, the reason why I cut mine a little bit higher than last year's cut was because that's what happened to me the year before. I want to create a little bit more of a sturdy uh, structure down mm -hmm. below. And then probably after, we'll see how they do this year. And then I might try to just keep cutting them back to that same height every single year. As long as you don't let too many years go and you don't keep cutting them up higher, you shouldn't have a problem and they should be able to be cut back to about the same location every year. Uh, Gail said, you must have a giant pile of plant debris from pruning and raking. What do you do with it? Well, right now it's going onto a pile in our neighbor's, neighbor's property. They have a huge pile they have going and they are allowing us to dump our stuff in their pile, which is... Very nice. So nice, so nice of them. Art by Whitney Bond said, do you think you'd be willing to experiment and try the no dig method and see how it treats you and show us the progress? I think I'd be willing to try it in a small area. We don't, we've talked about it before. We don't know a lot about it. Yeah, from what I understand, it's just like the compost method. Like you bring in a 
massive amount of con well depending on the size so you're like making raised beds you're kind of making like raised beds on the on the ground mm -hmm. so you bring in you know like i don't know that much a lot i see a lot of times they'll put that's like, cardboard. like eight inches is it oh yeah really? i think that's what you do i i see i've seen a lot of cardboard go down mm -hmm. and then compost go over the top of that isn't the um, compost too hot for stuff I guess it depends. You have to know what you're doing, probably, yeah. with the whatever blend you're... Yeah, it would seem like it's, it'd be too to, hot to, to bring in that plant much in. compost. Well, you're not digging, so... And you're not going below that cardboard layer, right? So you put the cardboard down, you so put you your compost... So you put cardboard down. Well, that's what I've seen in cardboard like Charles... Cardboard live in our soil forever. In a place we irrigated, it might break down a little bit quicker. Yeah, you're right. It might be enough moisture to... You know, that's... I think it would be interesting just try on a small scale. My, I remember uh, my mom was kind of like, she was telling my dad she wanted to save cardboard boxes and maybe yeah. put, because they have a buttonweed problem in one area of their garden. She thought that was one way they could maybe get over that problem. Sure. It's kind of like smother them out. Which probably is a good idea. Yeah, but I can just, my dad, <laughs> my dad, he's like, just plant in native dirt. Things yeah. just want to grow in dirt. They grow so much better. Don't well, put a bunch of crap in the soil. Your your dad works with farmers because he sells seed it's true. to farmers. Yeah, it's and a different so game. It, it's a totally different game. When you're yeah. talking about, you know, seeding a thousand acres of something, uh -huh. like, are you going to bring in eight inches of compost for, <laughs> you know, a thousand acres? Of uh -huh. course, that's ridiculous. So... I think that's where he kind of rolls his eyes mm -hmm. at some of those ideas because it's like, well, on a small, like, home scale, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got, you know, little beds, it could work. But I think it'd be interesting experiment for sure. I'm pretty satisfied with how our stuff grows. Yeah. You know, straight I think in the, the soil. The whole idea is that you're... You're not tilling. You're just not... Yeah. You don't want to till because it messes with the soil structure and that's not good. Mm -hmm. and, um, so... It'd be, it'd be it would be fun to try on a, on a small scale. Mm -hmm. We should do that. We should. So that we can learn. Yeah. We need to educate ourselves. Save some of those Amazon boxes. Yeah, yes. Okay, last video was helping out at the garden center. So I went down with the designs of actually setting up a big display toward the back of the garden center, uh, kind of by the tree rack area. And then I got there, we assessed the situation and there are so many plants back there. We just decided it was best just to work on putting plants out. But we ended up helping customers answering phones, working the front counter. There was a lot going on that day. I didn't even show that part of the video. Pretty sensitive about, um, like I let people know who are around me. Like if they walk in, I'm like, hey, I have a camera right there. Most people are totally fine with it, but I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. So like the times when I'm interacting with people, I pretty much have the cameras off. Um, so a lot went on that day. It kind of went differently than I had, had imagined, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. You seem to based on the comments, but Becky said it's uh, too fun, especially seeing you trying to tip that tree cart backwards. I don't know how much those trees weighed, but it was all that Monica and I can do to get them, like both of us, to get to the bulk tree. up a little bit. Oh, no, I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think I need to do that. Um, but yeah, they were heavy. Whew. Candace said, I love these field trip days to your parents' garden center. Do they pay you in plants? <laughs> no, I actually, I'm actually not being paid to be down there. I, I talked to my parents about it earlier on. I'm like, hey, so what if I came down and filmed some videos? I, I want to do it for several reasons. One, I love being down here and I miss the spring energy, especially. I also like to be there when new plant loads come in. Come, come, did I say that right? When new plant loads come in because it's exciting to see all the plants. It makes me uh, remember what's available. It makes me think like, I don't know, but I come, I come up with better ideas for our own beds when I see different things and, um, and a lot of things. And also um, it would, it's a good opportunity to create other videos for you guys, something different to watch other than us just planting every day in our garden, which I find exciting, but I think that maybe having a varied, some varied content is nice as well. So I just told them, I don't want to be paid. I will be down here just working because I'm, I'm filming. So I'm not definitely not as productive as I could be if I wasn't filming. They get some work out of me though. Yeah. While I'm there, it's a win-win I think for everybody. Uh, Diane said, how fun, looked like you were having a blast with Monica. Beautiful displays as always, such gorgeous roses. Yes, how many did you end up taking home? I tagged eight roses. I tagged three of the, uh, I said Alnwick rose in the video, but somebody says it's Onik. Oh. That's how you pronounce it, I think. Uh, Onik rose, three of those, three of the, um, another, it was a pink one. Are they all David Austin? Yes. 
three pink ones. Oh, I can't remember the variety. And then two Bosque Bells. They did get Bosque Bells. I transplanted some, the five from in front of our gazebo last year. Three did really well. Two struggled and ended up not surviving. So I wanted to finish off that grouping of five there at the end of the west side. So I got those two tagged. I haven't brought them home yet. Probably should here soon, but yeah, I like eight, I felt like was reining myself in because I feel like it could have done way more than that. But we've, we've got a lot going on here and I don't wanna get too ahead of myself. That's what happens every spring. You should see our greenhouse right now. Do you have an opinion on David Austin uh, in relation to like, I've seen, I've seen some negativity surrounding them lately, not about the roses. It seems like universally everybody loves their roses. Mm -hmm. Um, but about like their business practices, like it's harder to find David Austin roses. It's almost like they want to just be a, a male. Uh, what do you call that? Where you just buy a bare root uh, online, online. Um, and you have know, them shipped. Like they, heard, you just can't get them in any stores. I've heard rumblings, especially last year, because I know my mom was frustrated because she was very limited. They only let you order certain varieties and you'd, you'd just order a lot of like very limited varieties. Mm -hmm. This year it was like normal though. Oh really? She was able to get a lot of different varieties and more limited numbers of those varieties because she would rather bring in like 10 of, you know, 50 varieties of roses as opposed to like 50 of 10 varieties of sure. roses, you know? Um, so I, in terms of what my parents are experiencing, it's going back it's, it's going, more toward, it was easy Because I remember him. last year, you know, th that was an issue, but I was reading comments from people online as well who were saying like, I just can't find them anywhere. It's like the only way you can get them is to order them online. You have to be like a, you, there's an application process to become a David Austin reseller. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what all the parameters are, but I don't blame them. Like they want to make sure that their roses are being represented in a specific way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like, I know that far West in Boise, they are an, another, um, I think they were or are still, I know like a couple years ago they had them there. Um, so there's a few places in our valley that we can get them. I think maybe there's a locator on their website. Yeah. I've ordered from them too though. I had some bare root ones shipped in last year because again, my mom couldn't order in all the varieties that I wanted. Right. Um, so I ordered some bare root ones in and they did great. Mm. So I had really good experience both ways. Sure. And I know that online sometimes is the way you just have to do it if you don't have them available to you. I would much rather go down to the garden center and pick them out, which I'm sure you guys would too. Sometimes that's just not an option. Yeah. Um, Donna said, does Monica do a lot of landscaping in her own yard? No. Is she as enthusiastic as you and your mom about her outdoor living spaces? I think, so she and her husband are still renting. They moved around quite a bit because of her husband's job. And so they, are still they actually are just I think they might be building a house I think they just maybe figured it out yesterday mm. so they'll have their own space that and I think once you have your own space you feel more free to do stuff because up to this point it's just been kind of patio gardening which is kind of her speed anyway up to this point um so she like this year she borrowed some grow lights I sent two grow lights home with her and she's got peppers and basil going she's really into cooking a lot so I think that's where she will be really interested is in the edible side of things. I think she'll like to grow her own food and be able to experiment with some different varieties that you can't buy normally at the grocery store. Um, so I think that's where we'll see her start to like develop her own space and, and develop that interest. Uh, Amy said, love your parents' garden center. Super fun seeing what it's like working there on a spring day. Do you get annoyed when customers take plants out of your carefully crafted displays? Uh, no, or leave plants sitting everywhere. No, I actually don't get annoyed. Uh, it's funny to watch like customer behavior. <laughs> I don't know if that's what I should call it, but when I'm in the middle of making a display, like before when I worked at the garden center and I would be there for days in a row. So I could work on several displays at one time. So I dismantle one, which would then kind of make me need to dismantle three, four, five other areas uh, because I was shifting everything around to make it look different as often as possible. And then I would always end up with a pile that would move with me that wouldn't end up in a display. So I'd move it to the next area that I was working on. People would shop that pile. <laughs> like it was a sale pile. Nothing was on sale, like it wasn't clearance. It was just in a pile on the ground. And it's like, people are drawn to that. Yeah. Also, it makes me happy when I see people taking things out of a display that we've created, because it makes me feel like they probably saw that plant maybe in a new light. They saw it paired with something different or paired in a pleasing way to where it made that plant shine and made them want to buy it. I'm doing my job right. If people are buying the stuff that's displayed, then I'm doing my job right. And it always made me happy, never annoyed. 
Um, Sue said, you inspire me tremendously and although I don't have the land you have, I'd like to create my own little veggie garden and flower gardens around my yard. Where do you suggest I purchase raised beds from? Any tips on most affordable vendors and most affordable way to start? Um, you know, there are some really good DIYs of how to build your own raised beds out there. Um, and it takes like, we used redwood, which is a cheaper alternative to cedar. Um, and if you, you know, follow just like a simple box kind of method of putting them together, that's probably your cheapest way. If you want to buy pre-made ones, Gardener Supply has a lot of options out there. Uh, we've tried out quite a number of them. Like I've got a couple of their elevated raised beds planted in the greenhouse right now. Um, I have some of their cedar raised beds that are like seven inch boards maybe six inch, seven inch boards. I have those stacked behind our greenhouse with plants um, planted in them. Um, I know Epic Gardening has had the birdies raised beds and I think they're fairly affordable. They're like yeah. corrugated metal, so they're a different material, but everybody's got a different style. And I was looking at some this morning on his website. I can't remember what size, but it was like under $200 for a raised bed that's not gonna break down. I mean, mm -hmm. wood over time will start to break down. Um, so I thought that that was really good. I mean, you make that initial investment and it was a larger, like a four by eight eight or something mm. that's really good size was it four by eight uh this one's six foot eleven inches by three foot seven inches that's that's a good size bed ours are three by six our like larger beds in our raised bed and i i find that a really good size if it was four feet wide it makes it to where i can't reach all the way to the other side which you know you could get up and go to the other side and work on it but it's really nice to be on one side of the bed and i can plant the whole thing from one side without moving or i can weed it or harvest or whatever from one side i find that a really pleasant size. Uh, Debbie said, it's always fun to see these videos at your parents' nursery. You and your sister are so good to your parents. Oh, love that. I swear you all could create another YouTube channel called All Together with the Andersons. <laughs> Anderson, Anders, and we would all follow. Laura, just curious, do folks in town act casual around you when they see you filming? You must be a celebrity-like person in your town. Nope. <laughs> I, most people are just super encouraging about what we're doing, but you know, it's a small town. I've known everybody for so long. It's no, it's no like, it's no different yeah. than it was before. I do get to meet a lot of people down at the garden center. Every time I go down there, there are some of you guys down there who are just traveling through or who have traveled to this area specifically to come to the garden center. So amazing and so fun um, to meet all of you guys. Um, Melissa said, I really want to plant roses. I've never grown roses before and we recently moved to Minnesota zone 4B. Oh. I have a sunny side on the house that is pretty bare and I'd love to do a pretty trellis with a climbing rose, but I have no idea if that would work. Climbing Rose, it's a zone four. I love the look that you did on your house with the clematis. Would you work, uh, would that work with roses? Yes, it would. There's another trellis I actually have. I have not installed yet. I'm gonna look up the name. It's on Gardener Supply website. It's like, um, it's really decorative, but it's more like a half cage. Like it's kind of domed out. Mm -hmm. And then the top kind of like domes in. It's really decorative, but it's um, really functional because I think it'll allow for a little bit more airflow for your roses, especially if you're in a humid area. That's super important not to have like a closed in because those closer trellises that we have, those panacea giant trellis, I think, mm -hmm. is that what they're called. Um, the, yeah, that's what they're called. Those sit about four inches out from the house, maybe three, four inches out from the house, which is good. Um, but I think with roses, maybe even more airflow is better. Jardin, 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 Jardin. I don't know how to pronounce that word. J -A -R. Jardinier? Yeah, Jardinier. Jardinier. That's how Unique Stone told us it was pronounced, right? Yeah. Jardin. So it's Jardin, bowed wall trellis. We should link it. It's three pieces. It attaches to your wall and it's bowed out. I think they maybe even have a rose on there. And then you're just gonna have to Google yourself some zone four climbing roses because I don't know any off the top of my head <laughs> that are rated down to a zone four. Uh, Sydney said, that's a lot of heavy lifting. I'm sure your mom is happy to have you uh, there helping get things sorted. I'm curious, having watched you two moving the big shrubs and trees, how do you manage this when there are a dozen customers purchasing these bigger plants? Do they offer delivery? We do offer delivery. It's like $25 within um, like, 20 miles or something, mm. then I can't remember what the rest of the policy is. But um, so we do offer that, but it's pr customers are pretty patient. I mean, they're always excited when they're buying these big trees. It's an exciting day. It's an exciting day for us all. Um, but we, we get in there with forklifts we, as much as we can, like we'll move it out into the aisle and then we can come pick it up with forks and then we can pop it right in their vehicle um, without having to lift it ourselves using our own brawn. I, there's no way I could lift, like even manage to think about lifting a tree like that. It would take four people, probably. Or like two or three really strong men, probably. 
And this is the last question for this recap video. Rebecca said, how many employees do your parents have? It looked like a really fun way to spend the day with your sister. I was thinking about that. I think they have like 13, 14, 15, somewhere around there. How many, how many full-time and how many part-time? You know? um, I think only one, two, three, three of them are part-timers. Mm. Um, so mostly full-time. Mostly full-time, yeah. And it's a crew that stays all season, all year. Like they yeah. don't close in the winter time. I mean, work goes way down in the winter time, but then you start to work on other things like cleaning that you weren't able to do uh, during the busy season or like checking in freight. And then the, when the, the uh, nursery side is super busy, the seed side isn't quite as busy. And then when the seed starts like coming in the fall and like all the seed cleaning and stuff and bagging is going on, it's starting to power down in the nursery. So there's some employees that flip flop that work in the seed plant in the winter time and then they work in the nursery during the summertime. And they utilize employees cross over too, because my dad does a lot on the seed side now, way more than he used to in the garden center. And my mom does a lot more on the garden center side now. And that is it for today's recap video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you for all of the comments and questions this week. I always really appreciate it. Really love reading through all of them. And I'm gonna go plant some stuff. So I hope you guys have a great week and a great day. See you in the next one. Bye.